It was a routine Friday night misdemeanor contact. Four people in the car have alcoholic beverages. Two are female juveniles, two adult males. As the officers write citations, one of the males opens fire with a 9mm semi-automatic handgun. Police Chief Bill Collander would notify a mother that her police officer daughter was dead. Two days later, Officer Roop's widow would be consoled. It just breaks my heart that that poor girl just walked into all of that and, and uh, she had a bulletproof vest on and it just didn't do her any good. We will never know, but perhaps what we sense tonight is exactly what caught Officer Tonahill off guard. Residents of the area know the silent times can be deceiving. Some people will say that this was the year that officially put San Diego on the map. Starting off with the San Diego Padres, winning the National League Championship, later advancing to the World Series that year, which they would lose to the Detroit Tigers four games to one. And Donald Sterling, the owner of the San Diego Clippers, would decide to relocate the team to his hometown of Los Angeles without the NBA's approval, causing a major uproar in the city of San Diego and the NBA franchise. San Diego would also have one of the most deadliest mass shootings in California history that year as well, taking place in the San Ysidro neighborhood at a local McDonald's with a total of 23 casualties and 19 people injured. But as for local crime, San Diego would see a 64% decrease in crime compared to the year 1980. But still, crime throughout the city was still very much alive and relevant, with over 103 homicides, 393 rape cases, 2,616 robberies, and 2,819 assault cases. But one of the many things San Diego would see a huge increase in that year was the number of new recruits ready to join the San Diego Police Department, with a 20% increase after a 30% cutback in 1982, totaling in about 4,000 new officers ready to join the department. And among those new officers would be 24-year-old Kimberly Tonahill. Kimberly had only been with the San Diego Police Department for nine months, but throughout that time, she already made such a positive impact on her co-workers and her community. Kimberly was born and raised in San Diego, California, growing up in the La Mesa neighborhood. She would graduate from Patrick Henry High School in 1978. She loved sports and was voted most valuable player on the high school field hockey team, and was also the manager of the track team at the school as well. After high school, she would go on to study child development at Grossmont City College before she would go off to join the police force, entering the San Diego Regional Law Enforcement Academy in 1983, graduating in 1984. And after 16 weeks of training, she was assigned to patrol around the Central Division neighborhood around Balboa Park. But just like Kimberly, there would be another officer who was assigned to patrol around the Central Division neighborhood around Balboa Park as well. 31-year-old Timothy Ruop, a retired Navy veteran from Cape Girardeau, Missouri, who served in the Vietnam War before joining the San Diego Police Department back in 1982. He was an ordained minister, a husband, and a father of four, with most of his friends and family describing him as a big teddy bear. And even though him and Kimberly didn't know each other, somehow, fate would bring them together on one tragic night. Friday, September 14th, 1984. Around 11 p.m. that night, Officer Timothy Ruop would be patrolling his usual route in the Central Division neighborhood. And while he was out patrolling, he would spot a vehicle parked in a cul-de-sac near the dog park at Balboa Park. When he approached the car, he would find 25-year-old Joselito Cinco in the driver's seat, along with 23-year-old Victor Calcias in the passenger seat. There would also be two underage girls in the backseat as well, 16-year-old Gina Hensel and 15-year-old Dana Andreasen. The four of them had been out drinking and using crystal meth that night, and at the time of Officer Ruop approaching the vehicle, he would observe an open whiskey bottle in the center console of the car. And when Officer Ruop asked the two girls how old they were, he would then learn that they were underage, so he would then ask Joselito and Victor why they were out this late with two underage girls, 
and Joselito apologized and offered to drive the girls home. But Officer Ruop refused since he could smell the alcohol on his breath along with the open bottle of whiskey in the car. Officer Ruop then told the two underage girls to step out of the car and have a seat in his patrol car as he called for backup over the radio. And when backup arrived, it would be rookie officer Kimberly Tonahill all by herself. Officer Ruop would then tell her to go pat down Joselito and search his car as he began writing out a misdemeanor citation for Joselito and Victor. As Officer Tonahill began to pat down Joselito, he would suddenly push her away and pull out a handgun from his waistband and shoot at her point blank range, with the first shot hitting her between the gap of her bulletproof vest right underneath her armpit. And when she fell to the ground, he would shoot her three more times. He would then turn his attention to Officer Ruop, who was still standing by his patrol car, opening fire on him before he could unholster his weapon, shooting him once in the head. And according to witnesses at the scene, Joselito then walked over to the two officers and fired additional shots, execution style, into their bodies while they were on the ground. He would then walk over to Officer Ruop's patrol car and open the back door, telling the two age girls they were with, let's go. But both of them got out the patrol car and ran away. And as Osalito and Victor were getting ready to leave the scene, a third officer would arrive, 26-year-old Gary Mitrovich. Officer Mitrovich was already on his way to the scene before the shooting, but it just so happened that Officer Tonahill would arrive first. And as Officer Mitrovich approached the scene, he would see Joselito and Victor running away, and he would tell them both to freeze while pointing his firearm at them, but Joselito would fire shots at him, striking him in his left shoulder before they ran into a nearby canyon to hide. And Officer Mitrovich would radio in for backup and paramedics. 1199 officers down at Grape Street Park. I've got one, two officers down, I think. 10-4. 1211 yellow, I've been hit. 511 yellow, I've been hit. Uh, units ready to head by. 511 yellow. 511 yellow. Two officers down. I've got people, uh, Muppets from the area. They're into the park. Okay, we've got the ambulance on the way. 541. Units responded 28th and Grape. We have one report that the suspects were in a red car. Four suspects, no further description. Five, 15, we got a red car. After conducting a thorough search at Balboa Park, authorities will find Victor hiding in the canyon later on that night, arresting him and charging him with accessory to murder. But it wasn't until early morning the next day when officers would arrest the shooter, Joselito, hiding in the canyon as well behind some bushes, taking him in and charging him with two counts of first degree murder, and even finding the weapon he used and a body holster he was wearing at the time he was getting arrested. And it turns out, the whole motive behind the shooting was that Joselito had failed to appear for a court date back in 1983 for carrying a concealed weapon. And even though a bench warrant was issued for his arrest, it was never served. So him being on the run for a year and having a gun on him that night, he feared that he would go back to prison. No motive that has been uh, stated to us, and uh, at this time we have no definite reason why they suddenly turned on the officers and, and shot them. That's something that, you know, we can't stop it because it's always people that we don't even know. You know, it's always younger, you know, younger generations growing up, trying to get a name for themselves, you know, and uh, that's how they go about it. The one officer jumped into the water and took his rifle and poked him. And that's when, you know, the movement was made and everybody jumped in on top of him. Here where the suspect hit, first a shoulder holster and then a handgun are found. Held by police for murder and other charges are Victor Casillas, age 23, of Logan Heights, and 25-year-old Joselito Cinco of Encanto. Doug McAllister, News 8, downtown. After spending four years in the San Diego County Jail, Joselito, who was the shooter, will be given a death penalty at his trial on February 18, 1988. But just 10 months into his prison sentence at San Quentin, he will end up hanging himself with a pair of his shoestrings in his prison cell. And as for the second suspect, Victor Calcias, he was sentenced to 12 years in state prison in 1988 as well, being granted parole in the year 2000. A double funeral for Officer Timothy Ruop and Kimberly Tonahill was held on Tuesday, September 18th, 1984, 
at the Methodist Church in Mission Valley with more than 3,000 people attending the double funeral, and it was reported as the largest turnout for a funeral in the history of San Diego. After the funeral service, a six mile long procession of police cars and motorcycles with flashing blue lights escorted Officer Tona Hill's casket to the El Camino Memorial Park in Sorrento Valley for her burial. And Officer Ruab's services concluded at the funeral as he was later cremated. People die every day, some violently at the hands of others. But a murdered secretary does not draw to her funeral secretaries from Brawley and Solana County and Oxnard. The slain construction worker is not honored by the presence of construction workers from Los Angeles and Riverside and Huntington Beach. Their deaths would be no less tragic, their loss no less keenly felt than the deaths of two police officers. But Timothy Roop and Kimberly Tonahill volunteered to be our buffer against the worst society has to offer. And that makes them special, if not in your eyes or mine, at least in the eyes of their fellow officers. Most of these people didn't know Tonahill or Roop, but they didn't have to. They came because they know this funeral could have been for them. This is not the first time that I have eulogized the lives of slain San Diego police officers. Rather than getting easier, it's getting more and more difficult. I, I am sick at heart. We know who did this. We know who pulled that trigger over and over on Friday night. We know who is responsible, and we demand justice. Tim was an ordained minister, a man with deep religious convictions. He became a police officer because he felt that, given his purpose in life, he could have a more direct impact on people. Her sergeant describes Kimberly's reports as the best she has ever seen. Kimberly was not just accepted by her peers, and respect by the peers is sometimes hard to come by in our business. She was loved by them. Two very fine people. God, how I wish that, that they were still here. Please do not let us leave this church allowing those two San Diego police officers to have died in vain. In 1981, after officers Ronald Ebeltoft and Harry Tiffany were gunned down, Police Lieutenant John Morrison penned this eulogy for the department yearbook. He remembered something he'd learned in the military, that there are only three rules in war. Rule number one, young men die, young women too. Rule number two, you can't change rule number one. And rule number three, somebody's got to walk the point. Tonahill and Roop walked the point, and they did it so we wouldn't have to. Timothy Roop was cremated. Kimberly Tonahill was buried within 25 yards of Ronald Ebeltoft and Harry Tiffany and Kirk Johnson, all killed in the line of duty. Nearby is Julie Cross, the Secret Service agent killed four years ago. Dave Cohen, News 8, El Camino Memorial Park. Forty years after this tragic incident, Sarita Flaming, who was friends with Officer Tona Hill, decided to start a petition in 2023 to rename Balboa Park after the two officers. And in September of 2024, the petition was passed, and the park would take on the name change, naming it the Officer Tona Hill and Officer Ruop Memorial Park. Grape Street Park, filled with dogs and families on a sunny day, was a nightmare for Kathleen Riggs Roop. For many years there was the bullet hole that went through his head, embedded in the parking lot, spray painted yellow. This was where her husband, San Diego police officer Timothy Roop, 
and Officer Kimberly Tonahill were shot and killed exactly 40 years ago. They were citing two men at the park giving alcohol and drugs to two female minors when one man pulled out a gun. On Saturday, the city renamed the park after the two officers, turning Kathleen's dark memories to light. Perfect place to be. He loved dogs. We fell in love with him. Balboa Park. The setting is magnificent and it's full of light. Sitting beside her at the ceremony was former SDPD officer Gary Mitrovich. I'd like to thank Detective Mitrovich for his service. He was there the night Roop and Tonahill were killed and survived with a bullet in his shoulder. With the crowd here, I do realize that the community appreciates their service and their police department. And that means an awful lot because sometimes you go out there and you do your job and you just don't know if anybody really cares. This helps to let police officers know that people do care. The ceremony came at an especially poignant moment for the San Diego Police Department, still mourning the recent loss of Officer Austin Magitar. This has been a long time coming. Chief of Police Scott Wall saying this sets a precedent to honor fallen officers everywhere. Their time was unfortunately cut short, but their lives and memory have lived on through all the people that they have impacted like all of you. Kathleen says her late husband's spirit isn't just living on, it's cheering them on. He's up there in heaven going, whoo, whoo. <laughs> Perla Shaheen, ABC 10 News.